So please, everyone who's uh, been who be, are giving TA2, please collect the forms and uh, submit them. And also, yesterday, if people had to pay for their meals at Ginger, let me apologize first for this. There was some lack of communication. But please submit those bills also along with the TA forms, and we'll reimburse you for that. Second of this morning, so it's a pleasure to welcome Asuntu Singh from Makar University. So Sikkim was also very kind <coughs> to accept our invitation and short notice. He's here. He flew all the way from Australia. And I hear that he's not going home to Punjab. He's flying back to Australia. So that's really something. Uh, so Sikkim is going to tell us in two lectures about tense and metal. It's taken over in 15 minutes. So 10 minutes for discussion. So yeah, should be enough. Minutes. Should be enough. So the audio is clear? Audio is clear? Yeah. OK. Um. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming and uh, before I start I just want to thank uh, Professor Baskaran for the invitation and other organizers who have uh, helped organize this meeting and uh, hopefully we will have some nice discussions during this time. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Miles uh, for shortening my talk because he spoke a lot about what I have to say uh, today. And uh, so you can just think of this talk as me physically representing him here and saying it in the, Engl uh, in the Indian accent. Uh, right. So, so for people who uh, don't know much about tensor network states, let me just give a very brief uh, motivation for this. So the main context in which uh, tensor network algorithms appear is simulating a quantum anybody system on a classical computer. Now, this is both a hard and important problem. Why it's hard, I'll have something to say, say about that in a couple of slides. But it's important because all properties of matter are, can be understood as emerging from uh, the collective behavior of an underlying quantum anybody system. So be it magnetism or optical or electrical properties. So we, we are definitely uh, interested in studying a quantum anybody system, but owing to their complexity, the number of analytics uh, solutions available are limited, so it's natural to resort to uh, numerical uh, methods. And tensor network algorithms is one such numerical approach to studying quantum anybody systems. And as a numerical approach, uh, they've been around for over a decade now. And in fact, they can be regarded as a generalization of DMRG, which has been around for 20 years now and has in fact become the dominant method for simulating 1D quantum many, uh, quantum many body systems. So uh, as a numerical uh, method, there is ample numerical evidence that they work, that these methods work, and they're useful, and they warrant for the study. Um, so I just want to pinpoint a few key advantages of this, uh, these uh, methods over other competing methods. So they are a generalization of DMRG, but unlike DMRG, they can be applied to two dimensions as well. And then uh, the second advantage is that they can be applied to a large system size. In fact, if you have translational symmetry in your system, you could even go to infinite size. And the third advantage is that they can be applied to fermionic systems. So we know that the quantum Monte Carlo met, uh, method suffers from the uh, infamous sign problem. So we don't have any, any of that issue uh, here. So having said all this, I want to emphasize that our concern here is not about writing simulation code and getting some numbers out of a computer. In fact, the questions that we are going to be mostly concerned with are quite basic questions. What we really want to understand is why is it hard to simulate a quantum anybody system in the first place? Are all quantum anybody systems hard to simulate? And if no, can we identify the ones which are hard to simulate? And it turns out that in trying to answer some of these questions, people realize that the key property you have to look at is the entanglement in the many-body wave function. 
And this, in fact, is one of the key uh, powers or advantages of this approach, that in some sense, we're concerned only with the amount of entanglement in the wave function. And we don't really care about the specific details of the system we're trying to simulate or the underlying degrees of freedom, in some sense. So that was my little motivation for the talk. Uh, in this talk now, I'm going to strictly focus on introducing the basic formalism of tensor networks. And in particular, I will not be touching upon any specific models or specific applications uh, or any recent developments. So here are the contents of the talk. First, I'll tell you what is the problem that we're trying to address with these methods. And then the rest of the talk is devoted to explaining how tensor networks are used to address this problem. So just like Miles, I'm going to uh, make use of these uh, specific kinds of diagrams in my talk. And this is uh, uh, quite common. In, so these diagrams keep appearing in papers on tensor networks. So it's a common way of thinking about these methods. So I'll first introduce this diagrammatic notation. And then I'll tell you what a tensor network is. But at this stage, I'll be very broad and generic. So tensor networks really refer to a large class of quantum many-body wave functions. So at this stage, I'll be just talking about the common properties these classes have. And then in the second half of the talk, I will give you two specific examples of a tensor network, the MPS, matrix product states, and the mirror. And I'll say something about how useful uh, or how, how they can be useful. So my plan is to go to the MPS today. And then day after tomorrow in my next talk, I will have something more to say uh, about the mirror. And uh, just for fun, um, my diagrammatic notation is going to be different from Miles. So hopefully that won't confuse uh, too many people. So what is the problem that we're trying to address here? What is the basic setting? So in, and in my talks, I'm going to focus on one-dimensional systems. What we have is a 1D lattice made up of n sites. And each site contains a d-level quantum system. So this could be a spin or an atom or a harmonic oscillator, any quantum system which is described by a d-dimensional vector space v. Then the total Hilbert space of the lattice is simply v tensored n times. And this is how the Hilbert space may look like. Basically featureless. And every part of the Hilbert space is as dull and boring as every other part. So that's our setting. And what we're trying to do is efficiently describe states within the Hilbert space on a classical computer. By this, I would mean two things. One, we want to efficiently store a state within the Hilbert space on a classical computer. And second, having done that, we want to extract information from the state efficiently, that is, uh, such as expectation values and correlation functions and so on. And by efficient, I would mean that the costs for doing these things should grow at most polynomially in n. That's the computational definition of efficiency. Uh, that means I can scale my problem uh, nicely with n. But of course, the main problem to doing that is going to be the fact that the dimension of this uh, many-body Hilbert space grows exponentially with n. So if I pick any state psi from this uh, Hilbert space, I can expand that, ex expand that uh, in, in a tensor product basics, uh, basis. So here, i1, i2, in, they label a basis on sites 1, 2, and n. And in order to specify such a, such a state, I need to specify exponentially many complex numbers. So the ones did, so these are the ones denoted here, psi sub i1, i2, in. So this is going to be the crux of all our problems, this exponentially many complex numbers here. So in order to give you a simple example of how bad the situation is, consider the following ex example. So consider a lattice of qubits. So each side contains a two-level quantum system. And let's ask the question, how many qubits can we represent with one gigabyte of memory? And a simple calculation shows around 27. And in fact, I've been very generous here in assuming that only eight bytes are needed for storing one complex number, when in fact, you need more. But the real problem, of course, is that to add one more qubit now, I need to double the memory. So my first gigabyte was devoted to representing 27 qubits. But the next gigabyte is, re is required just to represent an additional qubit. And the situation gets rapidly worse as n grows. 
So the, the thing to realize is that we are usually not interested in an arbitrary state of the Hilbert space. What we are typically interested in are the low energy states of a local Hamiltonian defined on our lattice. So by local, I mean the Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of terms where each term describes an interaction over a small region of the lattice. So here, for instance, uh, it's a Hamiltonian made up of only nearest neighbor terms. So that, that's the typical, so that, that's the first thing to realize. So this is the kind of states, the, these are the kind of states we're interested in. And once we realize that, the next thing to note is that ground states of local Hamiltonians are special. In the sense that the amount of correlations and entanglement they carry are limited. So before telling you in what sense they are limited, let me just define what I'm going to mean by correlations and entanglement in this talk. By correlations, I would mean the expectation value of simultaneously measuring two operators at different positions on the lattice. So if you have a spin system, so measuring the spin at some position x and spin at some other position x plus l. And by entanglement, I would mean entanglement entropy of a block of L sites on the lattice. And uh, Bhaskaran and Miles have already uh, spoken about entanglement entropy. I'll just repeat this quickly. So how that works is, so how I'm going to look at the entanglement in my many body wave function is, I'm going to ask how entangled a block of L sites is with the rest of the lattice. And the way it works is I compute the reduced n three matrix of that block, diagonalize it, let lambda be the corresponding eigenvalues, stick that in, in this expression and compute this number s, which is the entanglement entropy. And this gives me an idea of how entangled this block is with the rest of the lattice. So in particular, if this is zero, then there's no entanglement and it grows with entanglement and it reaches a maximum when the block is in a maximally mixed state, which is described by a reduced density matrix proportional to the uh, identity. So in the context of many body systems, we are not only interested in specific values of this for a given block size, but in fact, how these values scale as I consider larger and larger blocks. So let me come back to how these uh, quantities are limited in ground states. So here I'm going to make a distinction between gapped Hamiltonians and Hamiltonians that are critical, so basically uh, gapless. In ground states of gapped Hamiltonians, what we see is that these correlations decay exponentially with the distance between the two-point correlators, whereas the entanglement entropy saturates to a constant. So as and as you consider blocks of increasing size, you might see that this entropy grows, but quickly saturates to some constant. On the other hand, for cri and in critical Hamiltonians, uh, the ground states of critical Hamiltonians, the correlations decay polynomially with L, and the entanglement entropy grows as log L. Uh, to tell you that this indeed is limited scaling behavior, uh, let me just mention that if I was to pick an arbitrary state from my many body Hilbert space and look at how the entanglement entropy grows, it will typically grow, as, uh, grow linearly with the size of the block in one dimensions. And if, if I go to two dimensions, it would grow proportional to the area and then in three dimensions as proportional to the volume of the block on the lattice. So indeed, uh, these scaling behaviors, uh, they are uh, special in some sense. So our key claim in this talk is then going to be that we can exploit these special properties to at least describe ground states in our many body Hilbert space efficiently. And we're going to do this using tensor networks. So the game we are playing is that it's true that if I pick and state arbitrarily from this many body Hilbert space, I cannot say anything about it. I cannot describe it efficiently. But nonetheless, there is a subspace of interesting states. And in fact, it turns out that this is a subspace we are actually interested in. This indeed can be described efficiently uh, on a classical computer. So before telling you what tensor network is, let me introduce my diagrammatic notation, which I just mentioned. And this is going to be very similar to what Miles was talking about, but I'll just change the pictures and colors uh, slightly. So a basic building block is going to be a tensor. And for the purpose of this talk, a tensor is just going to be a multi-dimensional array of complex numbers, basically an object with some number of indices. Each of these indices can take some number of values, which I'm going to call the size of the index or the dimension of the index. And I'm going to graphically represent an object like this, a tensor, by means of a 
of a shape. Now it could be a circle, a square, or some irregular blob, and some lines coming out of it. And each one of these lines is going to correspond to an index of the tensor. So let me give you some examples. So it turns out that one index is just a vector. So a ket, which is simply a column vector of complex numbers, I'm going to draw that as a circle and a line coming underneath it, emerging from underneath it. And here A basically corresponds to the number of complex numbers in this vector. The corresponding bra, which is a row vector made of the complex conjugated values, I'm going to draw that as a circle and a line emerging from above it. So our matrix is just a tensor with two indices. So here A and B, the sizes of A and B simply correspond to the number of rows, and the third index counts the number of matrices within the stack. And once again, if I fix a particular value of C, let's say C is equal to two, I'm left, that, that, that corresponds to selecting a, a matrix from within the stack. So notice that in the graphical representation, whenever I fix an index, it corresponds to effectively erasing that index from the picture. So when I fix C is equal to two, I basically erase this line and I'm left with a tensor with two legs, that's a matrix. And that's basically this matrix here. So next, let me tell you some basic operations that we can do with uh, tensors. Uh, the first one is contraction. This is by far the most common one I'm going to use in this talk. So by contracting two tensors, I mean multiplying their components by summing over one or more indices. And this is graphically represented by connecting the two tensors by one or more lines. And each one of these connecting lines or shared lines corresponds to an index being summed over. So this is best understood with some examples. Here's a simple example where I'm multiplying a tensor with two legs with a tensor with one leg to obtain a tensor with one leg. This diagram simply corresponds to the summation over here and it's nothing other than multiplying a matrix with a vector to obtain another vector. And this is gonna be a feature of all such contraction diagrams is gonna be that the number of open legs on both sides are gonna match while the shared indices are gonna disappear. They're gonna be summed over. Another example of contraction is matrix multiplication. And once again, this diagram corresponds to the summation over here. And let me also just add that the cost of doing this contraction is simply proportional to the product of the sizes of the three indices A, B, C. And in fact, this is gonna be true for contracting any two tensors with as many legs they can have and they can be connected in some crazy ways. So a simple rule for estimating the cost of the contraction would be identify the sizes of all the indices that appear in the diagram and multiply these sizes and the cost will be proportional to that. The, the size, the size. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry? Right, right. Strictly speaking, yes. Yeah, strictly speaking, yes. But for this talk, I don't really need to make that distinction very strongly. Right, but I haven't spoken about tensor product yet. Oh, yes, but, but then that, that takes, so yeah, so it is true that, right. Yes, no, it, it is true that uh, there is in fact a convention for labeling these indices. So this, right, this is, right, right, right. So this is going to correspond to a tensor in which the indices are organized as A, B, and C. And basically, a convenient way of thinking about tensors, which does not have the problem that you're indicating, is to think of all tensors as a map from a product of vector spaces into complex numbers. Yeah, but ordering on the vector spaces matters. Yeah, so I'm imposing an order in, in the clockwise direction. So A, B, and C. Right. 
So, and this this is just the graphical representation of the tensor, and not of the not of any constraints fulfilled by the tensor. And depending on the constraints, some constraints you might be able to graphically represent them, but some you would not be able to. So right now I'm just drawing pictures for objects that appear like this. I'm just drawing pictures for them. And No, no, sure, sure, but that would be some constraints fulfilled by the tensor, which are not capturing with these diagrams. So, for I think, just introduce, he's doing this, so please go ahead and we'll come back. Speak. Okay. So, I'm, I'm just drawing pictures for uh, things that I would actually write like this, and there are obviously questions on how I'm going to interpret this object as, well, what kind of a linear map it is, from what bit to space to what, and all that is not necessarily captured by the pictures. But we won't need to make all these uh, distinctions. They're important, they're important, and in, in practice, uh, these are made more precise in papers and so on. But for this talk, I'm just gonna be a bit loose with uh, all these uh, issues. So I told you a simple rule of computing the, of, of guessing the, of, of estimating the computational cost of a diagram. You just simply multiply the sizes of all the indices that appear in the contraction. So you can of course contract tensors, uh, more than two tensors. Here's an example where you have to contract uh, three, tensor, uh, three tensors. And once again, after making this contraction, you're left with an object with only three indices. So the open indices match on both sides and all the internal indices are summed over. And this is the corresponding summation, and uh, perhaps you would begin to see that it's slightly more convenient to draw these contractions than writing them out. So that was contracting two tensors. The next operation I want to talk about is taking the trace of a matrix, which is the sum of its diagonal elements. So I'm going to graphically represent that by connecting the two indices of the matrix together. So notice, after I do that, I'm left with an object with no legs, and this is just a complex number, in this case the trace. And then I can also talk about partial trace, where I'm tracing out a subset of uh, the indices of a tensor. So here, for instance, R could be the density matrix of two sites, and by tracing out one of the sites, I obtain the density matrix of the remaining site. So next operation is tensor product of vectors, or tensors in general. So here's an example, and this is graphically represented by simply placing the tensors next to one another without connecting them by a line. So here the size of this index is the product of the sizes of inde uh, indices A and B. This I've indicated by just drawing a thick index. And one can generalize this to what is called reshaping a tensor. So given a tensor with some number of legs, I can fuse some of its indices into thick indices to obtain another tensor with fewer number of legs. It's just in some way rewriting the tensor. And a simple example of that is reshaping a matrix into a vector. So you're given a matrix, and by just taking all the rows of the matrix, you concatenate them into a column vector, and that's what I'm calling reshaping here. And the final operation I want to talk about is decomposing a tensor. Now this is just the reverse of contracting a tensor. So simple examples over here are de uh, matrix decompositions, so such as eigenvalue decompositions, or singular value decompositions, and these can of course be generalized to uh, tensors as well. So as an aside, let me just uh, mention that how decomposing tensors is going to be useful in our context. And this is at this stage just an aside, but later this will come up in the main discussion. So consider the problem of storing a D times D matrix in the memory. This would require storing uh, D square components. But let's say our matrix can be decomposed into two separate matrices, P and Q, like this, such that the size of this intermediate index you obtain after decomposition is some chi, which happens to be less than D. Now, not all matrices can be decomposed like this, sure, but let's say our matrix does. Then instead of storing the matrix as it is, I can store it separately by storing P and Q uh, separately in memory. And this would cost me, so for that, I have to store a total of two chi d number of components, which in principle can be much less than d squared. So if, if such a de decomposition exists, this is just another way of saying that this matrix is not full rank. 
and the number of non-zero eigenvalues in this matrix are just chi less than d. So in some sense, this is what you are seeking. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. This this is going to be the this idea is the motivation behind building tensor network decompositions. The one usually has a tensor with many components, and one wants to break it. And you realize that if you break it in a smart way, you are left with a uh, with much fewer uh, components. So that was my diagrammatic notation. I've told you uh, the tensors are uh, represented as circles and lines. And then you can contract two tensors, decompose a tensor, take a matrix trace or a partial trace, and also the tensor product of two uh, tensors. So next, let me finally tell you what a tensor network really is. And the first observation I'm going to make is that a state belonging to the quantum, uh, the quantum many body Hilbert space, the psi, which I had written out earlier as well, already corresponds to a tensor. Precisely this object over here, it's an object with indices. And now from now on, I'm going to draw this as a circle with n indices. And each index of this uh, tensor corresponds to or can be identified with a site on the lattice. And it takes some d number of values, where d is the dimension of my local site. So I'm going to call this guy over here as my many body state from here on. And of course, each of these legs take d values. The total number of components in this is d, uh, d to the power n. And this is what we've been saying so far. So it's in inefficient to store this uh, object in memory. Uh, let me also quickly show you that it's inefficient to compute expectation values and correlations from uh, the subject. So if I have to compute the expectation value of a local observable, so which is non-trivial at some site and identity elsewhere, I have to make this kind of a contraction where I've placed the ket at the top and the corresponding bra below and the operator in between and all the other indices are simply summed over. So this diagram is basically just a graphical representation of the sandwich and the summation here. And straight away one can see that using the simple rule of estimating the cost of contraction, uh, if we have to do the same here, we just have to uh, multiply the sizes of all the indices that appear over here and there are d indices appearing in times. So the cost of doing this contraction is grows exponentially within. The same thing happens when you try to compute correlators. So this diagram is pretty much the same as before, except you have two operators now. And once again, the contraction cost uh, scales exponentially within. Here's how you would compute reduced density mat uh, matrices for a block of L, or matrix for a block of size L on the lattice in this picture. So here what I've done is place the bra at the top, this guy over here, the bra at the top, and the keg below. And by placing them next to one another, I've indicated a tensor product. So at this stage, if I just look at this portion of the diagram, I just have the density matrix of my pure state psi. And then I simply trace out all the indices lying outside my block. So this is the block in which I'm interested. So I just trace out all the other sides. What I'm left with is an object with L indices at the top and L indices below. And I can always fuse these into a single thick index here, a single thick index here to obtain an object with only two indices, and this is just the density matrix of that block. So once again, the cost of making this contraction also grows exponentially within. So, so far, I've just restated the many body problem we were talking about a couple of slides ago in this uh, tensor picture. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, many body state of mine, this tensor, and I'm going to decompose it into a number of tensors that are interconnected to one another according to some network pattern of my choice. I'll just do some graph, and according to that graph, I'll decompose this uh, uh, tensor. And since the number of open indices have to, be, have to be the same on both sides, each open index of this tensor network is identified with a site on the lattice. Now, one, one can always do this. So give, given a tensor, I can always decompose it in any way I like into any number of tensors I like and connected in any way I wish. So th that, that can always be done. But what we are going to do here is take a bit more pragmatic stand and say that I'm going to restrict my attention to tensor network decompositions that are going to be useful to me. In practice, that implies that I am going to consider tensor networks or tensor network decompositions that can be efficiently stored in memory and 
from which I can efficiently extract expectation values of local observables. And this simply implies that the corresponding costs are at most polynomial in the system size. So, not, so my tensor can be decomposed in infinitely many ways, but now I'm going to restrict attention to ones which satisfy these two constraints. And the first constraint is rather straightforward to implement. I further make a, a restriction that the total number of tensors that appear on this side are at most some polynomial in n. And in fact, the examples we'll be looking at, it's just going to be order n. So let's just say order n. So I'm going to consider decompositions made up of order n tensors. And the size, the sizes of all these intermediate indices is bounded by some constant chi, which I'm going to assume independent of the system size. Now this is a non-trivial imposition, but having done that, it's clear that the first constraint gets automatically fi uh, fulfilled. Any given tensor over here takes has number of components which are just some power of chi. You just multiply the number of uh, chi uh, uh, five times here, for instance. And then there are order n such tensors. So the total number of components encoded in this uh, tensor network, they are order n. So I can at least store, by imposing this, I can at least store a tensor network efficiently in memory. But the second condition, that is, to be able to efficiently extract expectation values from this decomposition, that's non-trivial. Yeah, but that's at least I can impose. I can at least give you a statement that I'll do this and we'll be happy with that. Right? Oh, sure, sure, it's not unique. And in fact, there's a large class of decompositions that will still satisfy this. And now in the next part of the talk, I will in fact talk about two specific uh, tensor network decompositions that are actually used in practice. And I'll tell you in particular how they fulfill the second constraint and also some of the other useful uh, and how they can actually be useful in the context of uh, describing ground states. So the first example is matrix product states, and Miles has already spoken on this. And then, so this is, some of this stuff is gonna be a review again, uh, but I'll have something additional to say as well. So the uh, matrix product states form a subspace in the many body Hilbert space, within which the wave function decomposes like this. So remember, this is my quantum many body wave function. Now within that subspace, it's some subspace in my Hilbert space in which this tensor actually can be decomposed like this and decompose into basically n tensors. So there's one for each site on the lattice. And once again, the size of this index, intermediate index, takes some chi values which is independent of n. And let's quickly check that the total number of components uh, is linear. I mean, so any tensor over here has chi squared d components and there are n such uh, tensors, so that's the total number of components. So it's efficient to store the MPS in memory as claimed. Let me also quickly show you that it's efficient to extract expectation values from this structure now. So we call that extracting expectation values corresponds to making this contraction when you look at the many body state as a single tensor. All we've done now is decomposed this guy into pieces. So now the contraction I have to make looks like this. But what we have gained by doing this decomposition is, by, by, by decomposing my large tensor into pieces, now I can do this contraction itself piecewise, which I could not do in the previous diagram. So for instance, let me start at one end of this diagram and contract these two tensors together into a single tensor. And then let me contract these three tensors which form a sort of a triangle here into a single tensor. And then so on. Notice that the cost of doing any one of these small contractions is just some power of chi. So I mean, I, if, I, if I have to contract these, two, these three tensors together, I just look at the indices that are involved in this contraction and multiply the sizes, and they're just chi, 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 and d. So it's chi to the four uh, times d. So I repeat this contraction all the way till I get to my operator, and then I do the same thing from the other side. And in the end, I'm left with this small diagram to contract. And once again, so this can be contracted at once. And once again, the cost of doing this is some power of chi. So I have effectively broken up my large contraction into smaller ones. Each one of them costed me some uh, uh, cost, which was some power of chi. And there are order n such contractions. 
So the total cost of making that large contraction was is indeed uh, grows linearly within. So it's efficient to extract expectation values from this structure as well. So I've told you that the uh, MPS is a computationally efficient structure. You can store it efficiently. You can extract information from it, uh, information from it efficiently. But the real question still is, is the MPS any good? I mean, that subspace I showed you in the many-body Hilbert space, that could be a subspace of all the useless states. So the real question still is, is the MPS good for representing ground states? That's our task. That was our task. And our claim is going to be that, yes, that is true. And indeed, the MPS, in some sense, is naturally suited to describe ground, ground states of gapped systems. So recall what I said about gapped uh, systems. So ground states of gapped Hamiltonians, the correlations in ground states decay exponentially while the entanglement entropy uh, saturates to a constant. What I'm going to argue now is that if you give me any MPS, irrespective of any Hamiltonian or any ground state, so you just pick a random state from the subspace, in any MPS, the correlations decay exponentially and entropy saturates to a constant. And so precisely the scaling behavior which I expect to see in ground states of local Hamiltonians. And let me emphasize again that I'm not referring to any specific Hamiltonian or ground state at this point. And in fact, these properties are going, they, they, they follow just from the structure of, the geometric structure of the tensor network. Just from the way these tensors are connected to one another, one can show that these uh, properties are displayed. So let me quickly show you how that works. And the arguments are quite straightforward. So let's look at correlations first. So once again, recall that that's the kind of contraction I have to make. And now I've simply decomposed uh, this tensor into pieces. So that's the contraction we have to make. What I'm interested now is to show that the value of this diagram, so we, we are not concerned with the contraction cost anymore. The value of this diagram uh, scales like some constant to power L, where L is the distance between these two operators, and where this constant is between 0 and 1, so exponential decay. So I, I want to show, uh, yeah, I, I want to show that the value uh, scales this way with L. So like before, let me just contract all the tensors lying to the left and all the tensors lying to the right of the two operators into single tensors to get something like this. Now I'm going to group the remaining tensors this way and then contract uh, tensors within uh, their respective groups to get something like this. And now for simplicity, I'm going to assume that my MPS is translationally invariant. What this means is that all the tensors in my MPS are the same. And in particular, this tensor over here, which was basically obtained by contracting a tensor of the MPS with its adjoint, that's going to be the same. So all these tensors are going to be some copies of the same matrix. So what we have here then is simply a product of a vector, lth power of a matrix, and another vector this guy over here. Now let me just eigenvalue decompose m into q lth power of a diagonal matrix and q inverse. Then I'm going to multiply q with l and q inverse with r to get this guy here. So here I'm just left with the lth power of the diagonal matrix. And this quantity is simply lambda to the l, where lambda is the largest eigenvalue of uh, this matrix m. And we can show that this eigenvalue lies between 0 and 1 if the wave function is normalized. So that's what we set out to show. So given any MPS, the correlations decay exponentially. Let me now argue for the entanglement entropy. So what we're interested in is looking at the entanglement entropy of a block of L sites on the lattice and show that the entropy of this saturates to some constant. Now this statement is equivalent to making another statement, which is that the rank of this reduced density matrix saturates to a constant. It's quite straightforward to see that these one implies the other. So what I'm going to do is argue that this is indeed true for uh, this block here. So if I have to say something about the rank of the reduced density matrix, I have to first compute it. So let me do that. 
So this is just like before, I've placed the bra MPS at the top, the ket MPS below, and then I've traced out all the sites lying outside my block. So this is the contraction, and I'm left with the density, uh, the reduced density matrix of my block. So once again, let me contract all the tensors lying to the left and all the tensors lying to the right into single tensors. And then I'm going to contract all these tensors which are lying within the block to get something like this. And then I'm going to absorb these left and right uh, tensors into the remaining two tensors. So each of these bend indices here, they take chi number of values. They're just the internal indices of the MPS. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten them out and join them into a single index, which will take chi square values now. So what I have in the end then is a decomposition of my reduced density matrix into two pieces where the intermediate index takes chi-square values and the external index takes d to the l values. So now if I was to look at increasing, uh, in increasing block sizes, surely at some size l, this external index is going to become bigger than chi-square. Chi is just a constant. It, just, it doesn't change with l or even with the system size. So then remember what I told you, what this decomposition tells us about the corresponding matrix. Uh, matrix. So once this DL offshoots chi-square, then the rank of the matrix is going to be chi-square after that, no matter how, how much you increase L by. So I've shown that, and then before that, the rank is going to be D to the L, and this is going to grow exponentially with L, and then, then saturate to uh, chi-square. So that's what we wanted to show, that the rank of my block, the reduced density matrix of the block, is bounded by some constant. And then it's straightforward to show that this is an upper bound on the block entropy as well. So I've uh, argued that the entanglement and correlations in any MPS look exactly like the ones you expect to see in ground states of gapped Hamiltonians. And this is not a proof that all gapped uh, Hamiltonians have ground states which are MPS, but it's at least a motivation to try and use the MPS as a variational ansatz for ground states. And that's what people do. And then the final question one has to ask is, uh, okay, given a Hamiltonian, how do I obtain its ground state as an MPS? And there are a number of algorithms out there, and DMRG is one of them. Miles explained how that was done. But in, uh, algorithms such as uh, DMRG, one usually uh, does a variational optimization of the tensors of the MPS to obtain the ground state. So one just starts with some random state within the subspace and says, oh, that's my ground state. And then let me change the value of one of the tensors in this MPS that lowers the energy. And that will take me to some other ground state or some other state. And then I change the values of some other tensor and so I'm going to move this, uh, move something like this in, in, in the subspace and hopefully converge to some state which is close to my uh, real ground state. So that's an example of, that's what people do when, uh, so when they use variational optimization. Um, another way is imaginary time evolution. So if you start with a random state in the subspace and apply this imaginary time operator to it, and as you allow t to go to infinity, you will project onto the ground state. And the point here is that this operator, which is quite large, that can be efficiently applied to the MPS. So you actually start with the MPS and you apply this operator, and it just corresponds to making some set of contractions, which. Yeah, keep with MPS. Yeah, yeah, very right. So we are here. Yeah, that's the other point. Yeah. So this this can be done in a way that you go from an MPS to an MPS. So so in this scheme. Yeah. No, you're fixing chi right from the beginning. Right. So, so then the state that, so chi will sort of define the correlation. That's right, so, that's right. So you have to start with something like You're fixing it and then uh, well, what, what you're asking is, let me get the best approximation of the ground state with this chi. And then you can later get another approximation by increasing chi. How is chi related to the density matrix? Renormalization group perhaps? It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. So the chi over here gives some idea about the amount of entanglement in the ground state. Okay. So think about it, this imaginary time evolution, 
That's right. You actually lift above, and then you make a truncation and go back again. So if you, if you like, I can actually show more details of any one of these methods, how they work. But here, I just wanted to outline the general strategy, please. Right. Yeah. But with this algorithm, you just stay, you go from MPS to MPS. So although you may temporarily lift out, but you project back again. And the point is that both variational optimization and this imaginary term evolution, that it can be done efficiently. So once again, one, it, they just correspond to making local contractions, small contractions. Exactly, yes, yes. But you have to do something more. So you have to impose some additional constraint on the tensors of the, the MPS. But you can do that such that this algorithm exactly preserves the symmetry. And then you can ask questions like, oh, give me the, the ground state in the singlet sector or the triplet sector. So for this time, you will be trying to discretize time. That's right. I'm going to, yeah. Uh, so in which case, you have a doctor uh, that's right. That's right. So if, if not explicitly preserved, that would happen. But there's a way of explicitly preserving the symmetry, even though you might be making a truncation. There is a way to do that. So that's uh, pretty much uh, the end of this talk. And it probably end, ended earlier, because I again blame Miles. So I was thinking of spending some more time on the notation and things like that. Uh, but let me, so, so and then in, in my next talk, I'm going to explain a bit more about another example of a tensor network, and that's the MERA. So today I just want to show you how it looks like. So once again, MERA refers to a subspace of the many-body Hilbert space in which the wave function can be decomposed like this. Now, this looks like a big mess. and. Uh, but, but that's because it, it, it's, it's got a much richer structure than the MPS. And I will explain what this structure is in my next talk. And I will also briefly comment on how the structure is related to the ADS uh, CFT correspondence. But I'll just briefly comment on that. Uh, nothing major there. So here, let me just mention that just like the NPS was a natural ansatz to describe ground states of gapped Hamiltonians, because we saw that if I pick any Hamilton, uh, any NPS, you, I observe the entanglement and correlations that I expect to see in ground states of gapped Hamiltonians. The MERA is a natural ansatz to describing ground states of critical Hamiltonians. So once again, just using the structure of the MERA, just from the properties of the structure of this tensor network, the appropriate scaling behavior can be observed in entanglement and correlations. So that's all what I wanted to do today. And hopefully this is also, uh, I've, I've set the stage for uh, talking a bit more about the Mera next time. So that's my summary again. And thanks. So PEPS, so the Mera is, uh, so the PEPS can actually be seen as a generalization of MPS to two dimensions. But the mirror, this is still, so this is again one dimensional here. This is for 1D systems. I mean, you have a mirror for two dimensional systems as well. But this is a two dimensional network for 1D systems here. And this actually, uh, this actually exploits scale invariance of critical uh, ground states, explicitly encodes scale invariance of critical ground states. And the MP is, that's some other philosophy. And, but it's true that in two dimensions, the Mera and Peps are equivalent. Non wave function. I was in my introduction to Q wave function. Yet this kind of content is manifest because we always write it as one function of n variable, some explicit form. Right. But if you look at Laplin wave function, it does have a product of two particle Right. So, 
Right. So is there any representation where you know, this is manifest? Right. So, so first of all, this uh, this representation we're just focusing on the amount of entanglement in the wave function. We're not imposing some additional structure. So, such as in the in the RVB state, we're taking that as being composed of singlets, and there is some uh, structure being imposed there. So, here the only thing we're imposing is entanglement. But if I understand your question correctly, another way to answer that would be that there are some ground states ground states that can be described exactly by these structures. Can we read it then? Exactly. So usually these are used in the context of approximating ground states to by by this kind of a parameterization. But uh, for example, the toric code, the ground state of the toric code can be described by an exact mirror without any truncations. Because I also have read some paper by some collaborators where they rewrite Laughlin wave function as a matrix product state. Right. I see. But it's not very helpful. Because one dimension is as large as the number of sets. Oh, I see. So yeah, I mean, so with, with, with the MPS, if you allow the sky to be exponential in the size of the system, you can actually cover the whole Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. So you can describe any state like an MPS. But it's only useful in practice when the sky is small. So it's not surprising that any state can be described by an MPS if you allow the sky to grow exponentially. But it should be natural and simple in some sense. Right, right. So, for example, the AK, AK, AKLT model, which someone would be talking about next. So that, right. So that has an exact MPS representation with chi just equal to two. Then you mentioned that the uh, toric code Hamiltonian, I mean, toric code ground state is exactly written. So, so, um, so it's not really built into these tensors. So people have just proposed. They've found out what these tensors are for the ground state of the toric code, and this can be done without making any approximation at any stage. And uh, what one finds here is that, so, so the mirror and this, I will talk about this in the next talk, it kind of is a description of the wave function at various length scales. So in topologically added ground states, what one finds is all the non-trivial information is in this one tensor over here. And it's, it's because of mirror's structure which allows this viewing the ground state at various length scales you can capture global topological properties in a very efficient way. But hopefully, this will make more sense next time. So, should we either you tell me that and help somebody to display the uh, Tory code Hamilton eigen state during the discussions? That would be very difficult because I have seen it. So, you mean how to build the mirror for the Tory code ground state? Yeah. Very Simply stated, right? But it's not it's not very straightforward to get these tensors. And in fact, Miguel Aguado he wrote a paper just on mm -hmm. he describes how to find the mirror for the ground state of the toric code, and that is again in two dimensions. And I wasn't going to touch two dimensions, but if you like, I mean, that yeah, can be done. Catch some volunteers. So, so suppose I have a parameter I'm going to tune and with some quantum phase transform. So on this side is gap, that side is gap, there is some quantum. Yes, gap. right. So your strategy would be then the sky, uh, you, you study the system at a fixed chi and look at uh, what is the correlation length and see that the correlation length grows. That's right. And uh, then try to identify the critical. That, that's one way. That's one way. You look at, uh, so you increase chi and you see how, that you see that this correlation keeps growing as and as you're approaching the critical point. And in fact, by looking at how the sky grows, you can actually estimate the critical exponents and other information related to the universe, the universality of the critical point. There are integrable models. Many about integrable. How will it compare with those models, where we know exactly some ground state? So people have, uh, yeah. So that's one of the things we do with these methods: uh, check them mm -hmm. in case we're using integrable models. Mm -hmm. And they, yeah, we've tested these for a number of. Uh, models and we seem to get good results. So I just wanted to make a comment in that context. Uh, for example, Dathe Ansar's wave function. It's a very common test. Also, but unfortunately, that also doesn't have the structure manifesting. Plus, there is one uh, integral model you can say, the quantum icing model, uh, yep. the quantum icing model in a transverse field, which you can solve by very simple Jordan wave transformation. 
and then also I believe you know given the Mera structure at the critical point. So that's right. Yeah. So Ising model is one example. It's a, but so there are. It becomes uh, free Mera or fermion. So at the critical point, it's gapless. So there has been some attempt to rewrite that wave function. And apparently, it exactly has this. Point. Exactly. So the critical point. So I think model at the critical point. Then what happens is and then you, you will talk about it. This tower gets truncated if there is a gap. So it's like Eiffel Tower, but it gets truncated. Whatever I have seen is numerical. Uh, okay. There are some way of writing some of these variables using conformal field or something. There, there is some aspect of this tensile structure manifest. I can tell more about it. So the other thing is, so the other comment there would be that the sky parameter is kind of giving an idea of the error in the approximation. And one can always increase sky to reduce this error. So for the Ising model, for instance, people have, so you can use the meta or the MPS to compute ground state energies and critical exponents and everything. And there, there's a with, with very high accuracy, I mean, eight digits, nine digits. So, Sikunda, uh, are you also going to say that in this structure, all these squares and so on, are you actually going to represent some degrees of freedom in the system? Well, right, exactly, so just like the MPS, all these tensors, they encode, they encode the degrees of freedom and then the wave function. To a different energy scale. That's right, that's right. So you will explain that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so this, this, this. So this Mera is actually a specific realization of real space RG. So in the, if I make a comment in that, conventional RG, you started the partition function and then you uh, want to expect, keep some expectation values the same and then change the operator and change the energy, and change the Hamiltonian. Here, as pointed out with Jeffrey Vida, what you renormalize is entanglement fluctuation. That's why they call it as entanglement renormalization. Apparently, all these things does it so you will explain that. Right. So there is a notion of renormalization of entanglement in the problem. So this is also something that I Exactly. So it's called entanglement renormalization. As opposed to. I thought we are studying the entanglement of the ground state. Yeah. So, in fact, you think that will explain. That you know, the squares will be called uh, disentanglers. Right, right. Triangles will be called. Uh, so, so it is. Uh, as opposed to coupling constants. As opposed to coupling constants, yes. In the, of a Hamiltonian, yeah. So I am, you know, I have looked at these things. I am not very clear, but it will be nice if these things uh, come up. I will, yeah. No, no, so. So, okay. and there's some entanglement information in the wave function which I can try to look at a subsystem and change the length of it and see how it scales with that and all that. Right. So now, what is the denormalizing that? Okay. See, conventionally, as uh, Miles pointed out in this talk at the beginning, you apply block spin idea directly to quantum system. Suppose you have a chain. So take blocks of three, diagonalize this problem, and then find out, try and keep some energy states and then see how they are coupled and keep going. So this was the conventional approach. But then, suppose you are given a wave function, yeah, you solve the problem and I give you a wave function. How do you see uh, the, the, how fluctuations, entanglement fluctuations, and various things are contained in this particular wave function? So what I can do is I can start with the wave function and start playing with, previously I played with uh, Boltzmann factor. I took it to the power of minus beta h in partial to x. Now, I take this uh, wave function, which is an amplitude, which is a complex number, and start playing with it. And this is the scale. So, I think it will become clear. No, I mean, here you have to get the eigenvalue of my amplitude. No, 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 some I, 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 I have a question that I have very sharply. So I have Euclidean wave function. 
Yeah. I have a formula for which I can calculate the entire group and entropy in the sense that I take exactly. a system of size L and then trace, uh, trace out the other things in freedom and then see how that thing changes. So I'm not satisfied. Now what do you mean by fluctuation on, of this object? What exactly do you mean by So your probability distribution here yeah, I'm wave function actually it tells you the nature of fluctuations in the n system. Probability distribution of like suppose I give you an n spin wave function. Okay. This is some number, you know, a complex number for every configuration. So this is like a complex probability amplitude. So not only with classical probability amplitude, you know, we look at variables and various configurations. Now with complex probability amplitude, you have something more. Then we want a time. Right? So to me, as an outsider, this is a new twist to probability theory. No, no, no. What do you mean a fluctuation of the variance? Oh, okay. I'll this tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not impressed. No bother. With the help of some in there and uh, some session, I'll take This is the same question. Since we are talking about integrable models, and Yang, you talked about beta answers, and which are intimately related to yang Baxter equations and break groups. So this immediately brings to the question as to how the symmetrization and anti-symmetrization oscillates are taken into account in these models. But in fact, there are more general things like parastatistics. Suppose I consider parabosons or particles with fract some non-abelian bridge statistics. There is a correlation between all the things and if one uh, brutally takes partial traces or to a new, there is no reason that one should get anything sensible. So my question again, which I asked earlier is, where are the correlations which can extend all the way through the lattice? And how are they maintained in the process of increasing the, in these approximations? So why claim, you made the claim he that... Does that so he has to you made the claim that Are you, you putting it on me now? Mayurana. Uh, so, uh, what, what was the question again? Sorry. So, let me tell the history of this. See, there was a talk by Professor Balachan last week where he pointed out that uh, if you take fermionic system, for example, in the coordinate representation, there is a confusion about entanglement because we have in mind non-identical particles and then we symmetrize and anti-symmetrize. So things can go wrong if you do some kind of partial tracing of objects which are not, which do not correspond to the observations. So then uh, there are this apparently construction of GLS construction where observables are focused on and then you do whatever you do. Now uh, the comment that uh, Sarath was pointing out that if you directly deal with fermion operators or boson operators, this need not worry you because you are in some sense taking care of symmetry or anti-symmetry. Right. Uh, so this was the discussion we had and it continues and that is Paul's question. Suppose you have anions and non-abelian anions, how will you go about doing it? I think some of probably you or your colleagues in the GIFRE do worry about non-abelian anions. Yeah, so actually, yeah, right. So that's the kind of work I'm doing right now, that extending these algorithms to study anions and to look at a billion and non-abelian anions. So it turns out that, so, so as I've spoken about these today, it's one, one can just think about that the context over here is spin or bosonic systems. And in order to talk about fermions or anions, one has to and one can impose uh, all the right rules. Uh, within the structure and within these individual tensors in the tensor network. But something additional has to be done to simulate uh, fermions, and I think you will talk about this. Yeah, fermions. Right, and for anions as well. Um, yeah, but that has to be done something, something more has to be done on top of this. But you were simply like incorporate the fusion rules and so on. That's right, that's right. So you have some constraints that your system, your because you're dealing with anions, there are some natural constraints. There's no tensor product structure anymore. And all these intermediate indices over here, so for instance, this index over here can be actually seen as fusing these three sites into a single site. And in case of anions, you have to make use of the right fusion rules to do that. 
So if you don't enforce that in this tensor, then it's just going to fuse this in some way which is not consistent with the fusion algebra of the anions. But yeah, the key point is that I have to do something additional on, I have to impose some additional constraints on these tensors. So I think it would be very nice if this is discussed at length during the discussion. You know, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Bring it, bring it very simple, yeah. Uh, it is very clear. Yeah. Yeah. The, the balance for solid. Yes, yes. It's product of singleness. Yes. Actually, talking about the Ferdinand uh, or Boson, so what you're actually doing is you take the side operators in the regular DMR. Side operator corresponding to either Ferdinand or Boson in terms of the occupation. And then transform it so that uh, the relationship is valid. Right, but you have to be a bit careful in doing that. Yeah, right. You have to take care of the face factors. That's right. That's right. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's, all. Yeah. that's right. That's all. So before we, uh, yeah. Fusion rules, and also when you are giving the matrix, when you are giving, when you are giving the matrix product answers, the way you fuse them together is very right. reminiscent of vertex operators that you use to describe conformal field theories. And you also mentioned that you can do icing model at the critical point. So is that connection somehow known, or is it true, or can you comment on that? So connection between the Ising model at critical point and uh, no, no, the, the fusion rules that you're using here as related to vertex operators you use in. So here I'm not using any fusion rules. So by my previous comment, I meant the fusion rules for an anionic model. So I was commenting on how to adapt these methods for simulating anions now. So all these sites now, instead of spins, they're anions. And I was commenting on how that changes this uh, slightly in that you have additional constraints on these tensors over here. If you have conformality, then when you take this layer after layer, you expect to repeat the same fields once you reach conformality. So then these triangular operations you write must in fact, I would imagine coincide with the vertex operators. That right. And right, so for the critical point, they are in fact going to be the same at every, all these, so this one over here is going to be the same as this one here at the critical point. So that's how we encode scale invariance. Hey, uh, so you before we close the session, just want to inform you that at 2 we have the next talk by Ram Shah and time dependent DMRD. So after that, uh, we will have T and then at least I have noted down several of the questions that has come. Mentally, I have sit down and write down. And then we will sit together and then have raise all those questions and then discuss at length in the same place. And also I was thinking that uh, you know, some of you may have some better insights into some of these things from your own field. So if you can gather people of you know, with whom you can talk, if you form into groups and then after dinner, sit for four hours and come up with some results. Tomorrow, we will appreciate that because it's a discussion meeting and workshop. So, yes. I'm just wondering whether the speakers no. they can also put out some uh, simple exercises or Home something work. that some, <coughs> some, some like Yeah, maybe Baskaran can do that. <laughs> okay, so what we will do is, I think. Uh, after Ramsesh has talked, we will uh, request the speakers to prepare some. Uh, so I should just in fact, one of the things I was uh, thinking about, thanks for the mail. Uh, Mahitz was telling about uh, this iTensor uh, website where he says you can implement something. So I would like some student volunteer to solve a problem tonight and show you tomorrow in 20 minutes how it, is, how it, how it works. I can't uh, volunteer to do that because. So thank you very much. So we'll go for lunch. Uh, this is across the road.
please be careful while crossing the road. There are silent motorcycles which go with speed of light.